Thank you for joining us for another power-packed message from Dr. Miles Monroe, provided by Monroe Global Incorporated and MonroeGlobal.com. We transform followers into leaders and leaders into agents of change. We hope that this message is a blessing to you as you advance your life and discover your purpose. Now, let's go into the message. On this segment, we're going to be focusing on understanding the reputation and the name of kings understanding the reputation and the name of kings write that down please that is our focus for the next few moments the reputation and the name of kings kings are very strange and unique positions first let me remind you of a few things the bible it's not a democracy it's not a republic the Bible is about a kingdom and the king's kids as a matter of fact if you want to understand the Bible there are three things you must understand you must understand a king a kingdom and the king's kids the three K's so you can remember that's what the Bible is about the Bible is not about religion it's not a religious book. The Bible is a book that has to do with the decrees and the commandments and the operation of a king. Very important to understand that. That's why we talk about the kingdom concept. Secondly, the original purpose and plan of God was to extend his invisible heavenly kingdom to a visible earth. I keep repeating this because this must get into your subconscious mind. God's plan originally was to have his invisible heavenly kingdom extended to a visible physical earth realm. That's what he desired. That's what he wanted. And then thirdly, God chose the concept of king and kingdom to describe his plan and his program for mankind and for earth. Why is this important? God did not call himself a president. He did not call himself a mayor. He didn't call himself a governor. He didn't call himself a prime minister. He specifically chose the term king. And that's important because if you are brought up in a democracy and you read the Bible from a democratic concept, you will misinterpret the Bible. The other problem with that is if you don't know what a king is, there's no way you can understand the Bible because the Bible is written from the perspective of a king's mentality. And number four, Adam was ordered and created to rule over the earth for God. So man was really created to be the ruler over the earth. The word ruler is the same word as king and the word king and ruler are also defined in the in the Hebrew language as basilia which is the same word for dominion so a king and dominion are the same you cannot say a king without a domain so to have dominion means to be a ruler to be a ruler means that you are automatically a king and so God his name is dominion and the Bible talks about God in the book of revelations John heard them ascribing things to God and John says they said to God honor and glory and power and then it says and dominion be unto you O Lord dominion meaning you are king O Lord and that's what we recognize God as if he is a king and man was created to rule in his behalf then of course there are qualities and characteristics that we need to learn about kingship that are very important now kings possess the power of decree and edict and we talked about that last session the edict of a king and the the decree of a king only decrees only kings have decrees prime ministers don't decree anything presidents can't decree things only kings can decree and we talked about that last session please get that tape or that CD and listen to it carefully now I want to stress however that we're going to focus on the last one that's reputation kings possess reputation and most of us don't talk about reputation too much 
Because in democracies, there is no real context of reputation. Only kings have what we call reputation. I've got to define what reputation is because kings have it. First of all, let's get a quick glimpse of the concept of king and kingdoms from the scriptures. And I'm going to give you a few verses. Matthew 18, the one that you have right now, says, Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. That's Jesus speaking. Now, Jesus is, is describing what, 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 the, what his message is and what his kingdom is. He says, the kingdom of God is like what? Say it loud. A king. Come on, say it with me. A king. Now, you cannot ignore that statement. Jesus said, the kingdom of God or heaven is like a king. So you've got to learn what a king is. You can't, he didn't say it's like a prime minister or a president or a mayor. And so to understand anything that Jesus said about his message, you've got to understand kingship. Secondly, in the book of Matthew 25 and Matthew 22, we find these words. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepares a wedding banquet for his own sons. Once again, we find Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is like what? Say it loud, please. A king who does what? Prepare a banquet for who? Now remember, we're talking about a king and sons. He said the kingdom of heaven is about a king and his sons. And he's trying to get them back together to have a party. So the kingdom of heaven is really not a religion. It's about royalty and monarchy and majesty. It's about, it's about royal blood. It's about, it, it's about the dignity of kings and their children. If you want to know how to relate to God, first you've got to learn how to be a prince and a princess. <laughs> of course, religion doesn't train you to be a prince, nor a princess. It trains you to be a sinner saved by grace. Barely hanging on until the rapture comes. So you don't even think in terms of being royalty. If Prince William today from England gets lost, in other words, he gets lost in the crowd somewhere and they can't find him, is he still a prince? Absolutely. You know what you are? You're a lost prince. One time, Christ tried to explain it one time, and he said, look, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who had two sons. And one of them decided he wants to cut off his relationship with his father. And he goes and he ends up where? In the pig's pen. But he was still a son. Now, what amazed me, Victoria, I'll never forget the day I saw this, that in the pig pen, the, the little boy, or the young man rather, was eating pig's food. What's pig food? Well, normally it's, you know, potato rind and, you know, old food, stuff like that. Now you think about slop, we call it, yeah? Okay. Now, a pig, a pig's food, the pig's food is food. Isn't it? In other words, the, the potato skin that you gave the pig was made by God. Not just the potato you ate. The skin you took off. Is made by God, which means that the son was also eating food made by God. But he decided to eat skin. Are you with me? You can decide to eat skin or potato. <laughs> God made the pig. And he also made the calf. You can eat pig. Okay, it's up to you. <laughs> the wood that they made the pig sty out of belongs to God. And the wood that made the house is from God. Same wood, but you can decide to live in the pen or in the house. Tell your neighbor, I'm going to the house. Now remember, when you've been away so long from your father's environment, you begin to think like the one you're in. Pig mentality. So when, even when you come home to the house, you still grunt. You don't believe me? Read the story. And Jesus was telling us something. He said, when the young man came to himself, he said, I will go to my father and say to my father, make me 
a slave, a hired servant. In other words, even though he was a son, he was going to settle for slavery. The mentality. And Christ said, the father said, this is my son that was lost. Everybody say lost. You see, kingship has to be again with you understanding that the whole program is about a king and his sons. I like verse uh, 34 of Matthew 25. It says, Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you are blessed of my father. Receive your what? Inheritance, which is the kingdom that was prepared for you how long? Since the world began. In other words, it's about you receiving your inheritance. Now listen, friends, I was sharing this in Orlando uh, 48 hours ago at a conference. I was sharing with them that when you read this verse, you got to be careful. Because we've been taught that the inheritance of the saints is car, house, plenty of money, wealth, fine clothes, beautiful shoes. And so we, we, we basically have been taught, listen carefully, that, we, that if, you, if you are with God, you'll inherit houses and cars and land and fine clothes. And so even some of our modern concepts of Christianity, which is more on the charismatic side of things, they pursue still prosperity in forms of things. Am I making sense? This is very important to, to correct this. Jesus never said you would inherit houses and cars and land and food and water and shoes and fine real estate and, and, and big bank account. He, didn't say, he just said one thing. He says, you inherit what? Kingdom. Why? Write this down, please. Here's a revelation I got just this week. The Lord says, whatever you pursue, you can lose. That's a heavy revelation to me. In other words, if you can go after a car, you can also lose it. Whatever you have to go after, you can also dispossess. Am I making sense? If you pursue house as a sign of God's blessing, you can also lose that blessing if you got to pursue it. Am I making sense? Please get this. So that's why Jesus said, look, he says, stop worrying about house and land, what you will eat, what you will drink. He said, stop it. He said, only religious people, pagans, run after those things. He said, but for you, not only do you pursue only the kingdom, but that's your inheritance. Hmm. Hallelujah. You don't understand. Okay, a kingdom has in it food, clothes, land, car, dress, shoes, and plenty of wealth. Now, God says you could, be, you, you, you could run after the things or just get in the kingdom. You getting it? That's why he says his burden is light. Because if you try to pursue those things, you're going to wear yourself out. And the problem is, whatever you can pursue, you can lose. I hope you get this point. See, the devil is a cool devil. The devil loves prosperity gospel. Why? Because you still miss the kingdom. You ain't got the message yet. If you hold in faith for car and house and land and food and believe in God for this stuff, the devil will even help you get it. Because if he can help you to get something, he can also take it from you. Hallelujah. Here's a good example. If you're hungry, you can go and throw a line in, a, in the water, in the sea, and catch a fish. Right? You take it, you eat it, and what happens? Hungry again, right? And you go back and you throw a line again and you catch some fish, you eat it, a couple of days, you're hungry again, you go back. And you spend the rest of your life just kind of fishing for prosperity, fishing. You get something, fishing. And God says, you know something, this ain't working. He said, he said did you realize that you own the ocean? See the difference? You can either go fishing or own the lake. The kingdom is the whole thing. And so he says, your inheritance is the kingdom. You're supposed to inherit the whole shebang. You don't, you don't go after things. You, you, you inherit the source where the things come from. 
Seek ye first. We talk about kings. Why do we need to study kings? The ultimate king is Elohim himself. Let's see what God says about himself. Watch this. 1 Timothy 1, 7, 17, it says what? Out loud. Now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. What does he call himself? The king. Eternal. He didn't say eternal president, eternal vice president, eternal mayor, eternal governor. He could have used those words, but he didn't. He says, I am a king. Look at this next one. Uh, this word king is the word malak in Hebrew, and it means ruler. And Basilian in Greek means ruler. And both of these are found in the book of Timothy. 1 Timothy 6.15. Here's what it says. God, the blessed and only ruler, the king and kings and lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see. To him be honor and glory forever. Amen. Now both words are used here in this verse. He is first ruler and then he's king. Malek and Basilia. Very important about God. He is God and above all gods. Very interesting. Now what did Jesus say? Jesus says, the kingdom of God is about a king and his sons. If God is immortal, then you are immortal. If God is eternal, then you are automatically eternal. That's why when you die, you don't dead. <laughs> Forgive my English. In other words, when you die, they call it eternal life or eternal death. Because you are immortal. Mortal means flesh. Immortal means fleshless. You, are, you, you can live forever. You're just like your father. You can live in the pig pen or you can live in the house. Now, Matthew 4, 17, one of my favorite verses. Let's talk about Jesus Christ coming as a king. And as we think about this time of year, we think about this great entrance. It says in verse 17 of Matthew 4, from that time on, Jesus Christ began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Luke 4, 43, he says, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of heaven, for that is why I was sent. He also talked about Luke 12, 32. He said, do not be afraid, little flock, for your father is pleased to give you the kingdom. Luke 22, 29 says, I confer on you, he says, a kingdom, just like the Father conferred on me. Everything he talks about is the kingdom, the kingdom. And he says, I came to give you that. The Father gave it to me, I gave it to you. I don't want to touch that, that's too deep. But anyhow, I'll mention it. Jesus didn't need a kingdom. That's why he conferred it. <laughs> it was given <laughs> oh man do you understand me he didn't need it why he owns it he gave it to you in the first place you lost it so he went he came to get it back and now he's conferring it back on you so he says just like the father gave me the kingdom back I'm giving it back to you you got it in the first place can I hear an amen, amen. what about Jesus Christ John 18, 36, no question whether he's a king. He's not a prime minister, he's not a president. Let's see what he says. Here's what it says in the book of John 18, 36. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to pre pre prevent my arrest by the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from this world, it's from another place. This is proof that the Jews did not kill Jesus. This is proof that the Romans did not kill Jesus. This statement. He said, I could call my soldiers now to deliver me, but I don't want to. Why? No man takes my life. I lay it down. Don't you ever think that the Romans or the Jews or anybody killed Jesus? In the book of Isaiah 53, it says very clearly, it says, it pleased the Father to slay him. No one killed him. He laid his life down. And that's proof that he didn't need anyone to defend him. Now, look at this other verse. Very important. Verse 37. Pilate says, then are you a king? His answer is fantastic. Jesus said, you are right in saying that I am a king. In fact, 
for this recent Christmas came. No, sorry. For this reason, I was what? Born. There it is. The reason why I was born, he says, is to do what? To become as a king. This is very important. We think that he came as a lamb, lowly, you know, a little, little, little thing. No, he says, my reason for coming is to show that I am a king. And then he says, for this reason I came into the world to testify to the truth. What truth? I believe he's talking about this. I came to show you that you ain't supposed to be in no pig pen. Amen. I came to reveal to you who you are. Thank you very much for them two hands. This is so true. He said, look, the reason why I came is not to get you to heaven, but to introduce you to yourself. And the only way for me to introduce you to yourself is to show you what yourself looks like. So I, for this reason I was born, Pilate, I came to show you what a king looks like. Oh, hallelujah. And if I am a king, then I came to show you how you're supposed to live and think and act and rule in the earth. For this reason was I born. Very interesting. Now, I wanted to show you those verses because I want to tell you that because he's a king, we've got to study kings. Now, I've given you nine different things that a king is. I got about 27 of them. I won't give you all of them because we won't be able to take it and you can get tired of kings anyhow. But I know, I know them so I can benefit, so I can get blessed. Okay? You only can have faith in what you know. All right? So you can tell me when you're tired of me teaching on the king, I stop. Only problem is I know it. So when you see me getting blessed, that's because I know a level of revelation. And you can only have faith for what you know, and according to your faith, so be it unto you. You cannot have things happen to you if you don't know them. You gotta know them. That's why the greatest enemy of man is a lack of what? See, that's our problem. The king. Now, here's this one, number nine. I want to tell you this. The king's reputation is very important. Write these things down, please, by reputation. Now, kings carry what they call a reputation. And a reputation of a king is important to a king. <laughs> Try to describe what, it, what this is. First of all, the reputation of a king is defined as a number of things. Number one, it means the king's respect. Now kings are very jealous of their respect because kings love to be respected by other kings. Oh boy. When, when, when you study this stuff, your mind gets blown because it shows you how stupid you was. Do you know that a king is not really interested in what his subjects think? I thought he was. No, he's interested in what the other kings think about him. <laughs> you know, I, I read the scripture in the Bible, Galatians chapter 3. Can you turn there a minute? Chapter 3 of Galatians. And I couldn't figure this out for a long time until I understood kingdoms. Jesus is talking through Paul in Galatians 3. Everybody got it? You got it? Look at verse 10. Can you read it loud for me? What is that? Out loud, please. All who rely on observing the law is under a curse. Can you read verse 11? Clearly what? No one is justified before God by the law. Because righteous shall live by what? faith. Now I kept thinking the righteous live by faith. That means they live by what they believe. Now in the same book you'll find where he talks about how this faith supposed to work. Uh, in the book of Ephesians, turn to Ephesians chapter 3. What kind of faith Paul's talking about? Ephesians chapter 3. Everybody got it? Read verse 10. What's it say? For his intent was that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God would be made manifest to who? To who? To who? To who? To who? To who? Read it again. His intent. 
<laughs> his original purpose was what? That his wisdom would be made manifest not to the people, but to who? The rulers who were. Who are where? In the heavenly realm. It's like the kings don't want to show their reputation, respect to the people. Matter of fact, listen carefully, it's going to be heavy. The people are his reputation. Oh, Lord, y'all ain't going with me. I can feel it, but anyhow, I pray it. I pray it. Listen, he says, look, I want to show my wisdom. Everybody say manifold. Manifold means many-sided. Or dimension. In other words, I want to show the different parts of me, how I am, what I'm like. I want to show every part of me, not to the people, but to the rulers who are where? In the heavenly realms. Who are these rulers? All the principalities who think they're great that he made. <laughs> oh boy. God wants to show off his reputation to anyone who thinks there's king. And he wants to do it how? Through the church. The called out ones. He said, look, I want the devil to see what I'm like. See, let me tell you. Oh, man, I can't teach this. He said, look, I'm not going to bless you so you can brag among your friends. Because I want to bless your friends too. He said, I want to bless you so the devil can see what I am like. Yeah. Is anybody here? He said, I want to show a dimension of me that the angels will still wonder, wow, what kind of God is that? Look what he just did through that good woman or that man. Thank you very much, babe. It's not about showing off to humans. We don't fight against flesh. God going to bless you so that the spirit world could be in shock. I believe God's greatest weapon against the devil is to let you overcome every obstacle he throws in your way. That's God's great. Ah, oh, you don't understand. That's when he shows his kingship. That's why God would allow you to go right into the trap the devil set for you. Put you in the hole, lock the door, put the chains on, and they say, now let me show the devil what kind of king I am. And he'll bring you out of it. Now, you're going to see why in a minute. It's because of his reputation. Look at this next one. Reputation means the king's honor. Kings are high on honor. Whenever you read majesties and kingdoms, you always find this word honor. When you look at the book of Revelations, John saw the great king on the throne. John says, to him be glory and power and honor. Now, honor means what? Esteem. Turn to the book of Psalm 8. Tell your neighbor, honor me. I'm going to show you something about kings. Every king must possess honor. Honor means that the king is so awesome, you have to respect him. So a king does things so that you can honor his name. Can I hear an amen? amen. No king exists without honor. Now look at Psalm 8. It, it starts off, now this is a very majestic psalm. You notice that? It's a psalm of kings. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Guess who wrote this? A king. And who, guess who he's writing about? Kings and a king. He's writing about God and you. Verse 1 says what? Oh, Lord, my Lord, how majestic is your name. That's another term for reputation. How majestic is your reputation and what? All the earth. In other words, you have done so many things, the earth stands in awe of you. Then it goes on to say what next? You have set your glory above the heavens and from the lips of infants you have ordained praise. Keep reading. Because of your enemies to silence the foe. Stop reading. He said, look, I'm going to bless you through children. <laughs> you get that? He said, look, I'm going to use the infants of earth to mesmerize the devil. It. He says, I'm going to use them to confound the foe. I tell you what, 
if you understand kingdom you stop worrying because the things you think you're going through you're right And you keep saying it, girl, you don't know what I'm going through. That's a good statement. But emphasis is not, I am going, it is true. <laughs> because why? God's about to make the foe ashamed. Come on, somebody. He said, I'm going <laughs> to... Oh, hallelujah. He said, look, the devil thinks you're just a little baby, little puny, little weakling. He said, but I'm going to use you to make the foe ashamed. In the next three weeks, God's going to do something in your life. It's going to mess the devil head right up. I tell you, your Christmas is going to be a Christmas you never expected for the sake of the king. Can I hear an amen? amen. Listen, I live this way. I live, this is not a preaching. I don't preach things I don't believe. I live this way. Whenever I get in the situation, I say, God, your name is on the line. In other words, I don't say get me out. I tell you, your name in trouble now. Y'all can get it after I'm gone. I mean, when I, whatever happens, when I'm driving or riding a car or driving a plane or whatever, you know, it's said, Lord, if this thing don't work out, I read it. Now, everybody that know, I tell them who I belong to. That's why it's important to tell them he is your Lord. Lord means what? Owner. You own me and I made it public. So you better fix this for your reputation's sake. Read the next verse. What does it say? When I consider your heavens, the works of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you set in place, what is man that your mind is full of him and the son of man that you visit here? Read it now. You made him a little lower than Elohim, yourself. Read on. And you crowned him with what? Glory. Oh, oh there's the word. And honor. Stop reading. See, he had to give you honor because you are also a king. Can I hear an amen? God bless you, ma'am. Let me tell you something. God, you listen to me. Listen to me. God is going to fix your situation because he had to make the devils honor you. Oh, glory. It's not about you beating your people in the job or becoming better in your family. It's nothing to do with humans. It's about them rulers out there, them principalities who think they're controlling things. He said, I'm going to fix this to make them ashamed. You ought to give him praise right now. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. He said, I'm going to do it for the sake of of your honor. I'm going to protect your honor. I'm going to preserve your honor. We're going to protect your reputation. Come on, lift your hands. God going to protect your reputation. Oh, hallelujah. See, you've already told some people some things about how good God is. Now you put pressure on God. Now you got to make it happen so he can honor you. God got to bless you to protect you. Come on, say it. Bless me to protect me. Give him a praise. Clap your hand. Praise him. You got to bless him. It's about kingdom. Look at this next one. The king's worth is his reputation. Very important. All kings <laughs> build their reputation on how much they are worth. That's why kings always want a lot of money, a lot of land, a lot of power, a lot of gold and silver, because their worth impacts their position with other kings. Oh, man, you ain't got it. <laughs> David was a king. And every time David thought about God, David felt ashamed. You missed it. David was a king. But every time David thought about God, he was ashamed. He says, there's none about you. When you read David's Psalms, it was a king talking about another king. He says, you are above all things. How much? Majestic is your name. In, all, in other words, God mesmerized David. He said, when I consider the heavens that you have made with your own hands, 
He says, whatever you made, you own. The earth is the Lord's. And the fullness. David says, my God, you are worth everything. How do you compare with God? Now, some of y'all think, okay, that's great. That, that's God. But guess what? He made you his son. No, no, no. You, you get it. And about his son, he put you out there in the midst of the marketplace. Now he has to make sure that your worth is equal to his worth. <laughs> so he says, my God shall supply all of your needs according to what? His wealth. He deserves a praise again. Says to me, Lord, prosper me to protect your reputation. That's why he want to prosper you. That's why he gives you what? He doesn't give you things. He gives you the whole kingdom. Could you imagine two kings talking? One of them says, I own a car. And I own five houses. And 10,000 acres. And he's talking. And he talked for two hours, eh? And when he finished, you say, my time. I own the whole kingdom. Come on, that's a good place to clap. You missed it. Hallelujah. <laughs> you, say, well, you know, the time said, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? How shall we live? Jesus said, stop doing that. He said, just seek for his kingdom. When someone asks you, how am I going to make it in 2004? Your answer should be one word. Kingdom. His honor and his worth is his name. Now, this, 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 this part blew my mind. The glory of a king's name is his reputation. See, kings live on their names. Oh, Lord, have mercy. You understand me? Oh, listen to me. Mr. Boss, God says, look, I am a king. Which means immediately my name is always in question. <laughs> I was watching a movie yesterday. I don't normally watch movies, you know. But I was watching a movie because I had a little bit of time. I was, and this movie, this new movie I would call Pirates. The Curse of the Pearl, Black Pearl or something. Very interesting movie. And this guy who was the captain and the star of the movie said something that blew my mind. Kingdom stuff. The guy said, when he was captured, the fellow who captured him said, you are the worst pirate I ever saw. He says, matter of fact, you are the worst I've ever imagined. Why are they afraid of you? He says, all I know about you is your name. And the fellow answered, you know my name. <laughs> no, y'all didn't get it. <laughs> he says, if I was so bad, how come you know my name? Come on, clap your hands. <laughs> that was a, I said, that's kingdom right there. Listen, when a king has honor, his name precedes him. You don't understand. So when you read the Bible, it says, I came in the name of this king. I came in the name of that king. And some name, they say, who is that king? See, some of you all don't understand. When Pharaoh heard Moses talk, Moses come to get Pharaoh's wealth. Moses says, Pharaoh, give me all your wealth, all your human wealth, all your employees. I come to get the whole workforce. Pharaoh says, who sent you? Now you see this king talking. And Moses acting like a king. So he says, how can you come to ask me for all my wealth? Moses' answer was, I came in the name of a king. Pharaoh's question, what is his name? See, you don't understand this important question. Because if a king is so great, how come I don't know his name? 
So Moses, let me introduce you to him because you're going to feel him in a little bit. Come on, tell your neighbor, praise the Lord. His name is I am whatever he is. <laughs> Woo! And the Pharaoh says, who is this I am? Moses, you don't want to find out experientially. We know the story. God had to introduce himself to Pharaoh in a very interesting, difficult way for Pharaoh. And it took seven introductions for Pharaoh to finally figure out the brother owns the whole thing. Come on, clap your hands. He owned the frogs. He owned the locusts. He owned the water. He owned the, the famine. He owned everything. I better let these people go. I found a king greater than me. His name. His name. His name. That's why you should never go with your name. You have to be in the same... You all don't understand. See, when you... Anybody getting this? There's some people you even ain't supposed to deal with. That's why it's tough to get a good fight in boxing. Because you got to wait till the other fella coming through the ranks to be in your class. Then they say he can fight you. Let me tell you what. The Bible says Jesus knocked the devil out, made a show of him openly, took off all his clothes, made him naked, took the keys and tell him, I'll be back. Don't fight the devil. That only happens in the Bahamas when it rains and the sun out. <laughs> you know that, right? <laughs> no, God never got involved. God never fought the devil. Matter of fact, based on the Bible, it's very clear. It says that when there was a little scrimmage in heaven, a little brief scrimmage, it, uh, you know, the Bible says, Jesus said, I saw Satan like lightning. Form. He said, I didn't get involved in the fight. I just, oh, he went. <laughs> well, listen, this must be the wonderful thing to see Jesus on earth. Jesus said, look, you guys are afraid of devils. He said, look, let me tell you something. He says, I have placed every scorpion every demon power you shall tread upon serpents and scorpions and all the power the end, under your feet not not his yours that means whenever you talk to the devil you can't look up you gotta always you all still ain't got it <laughs> devil get out of my kitchen Always below you. Why? You are honorable. You're honorable. You only deal with honorable people. Jesus didn't deal with the puny king. Very important. The influence of a king is his reputation. And the testimony of a king is his reputation. A testimony is important. Kings test or like to have themselves tested to prove their reputation, their name. Sheba, the queen of Sheba, an African state, heard about the name of Solomon. Remember the reputation. She, didn't, she, she never saw him before, but his name came all the way to Africa. Now when a king hears another king's name, and that king's name becomes more spoken of than his name, he becomes jealous. Because there ain't supposed to be no name greater than your name if you are a king. So when she heard all of her people talking about this Solomon, you know, the neighboring kings talking about this Solomon, and his wisdom and his power and the glory of his kingdom and all the buildings he's built, she said, now who is this man? So she's now going to check him out and she's going to prove to him that she's a greater monarch. So she takes all of her wealth, all of her power, all of her, her money and 
gold. And she laden down her donkeys and camels. And, and she comes with a caravan over 700 people. And I mean millions and millions of dollars worth of equipment and gold and sheep and goats. And, and she's going to prove to Solomon he was a puny king. Solomon. <laughs> Do you know what throne he's sitting on? The throne of what? David. That's a deep statement. Because it did say that someone else was sitting on that, that throne. So she come in now to show the king that God plays in power. She's greater. When she arrives, before she even got to him, she saw the way his people were dressed. Y'all don't understand. Watch out. Huh? Watch out. The Watch glory out. of the king, I tell you, Watch is out. the people he has. Yes, sir. Watch out. David ain't got to see him yet. Just see how the people were dressed. She said, she, the Bible says she became weak. When she saw the food his servants were eating. And the plates were gold. And the spoons were silver of his servants. I wonder what his plate was made out of. My God. You see, let me tell you why. Because a king, I got to go. Because a king, a king wants you to know his reputation before you get close to him. So he makes his servants prosper plenty, plenty, plenty. Oh, that's why you're going to make it? Matter of fact, he wants you to eat out of golden plates. Not so you could say you got golden plates. That's ambition. He wants you to get a golden plate so that the other people could say, Who is your king? <laughs> the Bible says, when she saw the fine robes the servants were wearing. Come on, sit up straight. Tell your neighbor, this is it right here. See, let me tell you why God wants to fill your closet up. Not so you could show off among people. But he wants when you walk out of your house tomorrow. See, some of y'all got some cheap shoes you wear on Monday. And then you wear good shoes on Sunday. Reverse it. Wear your good shoes on Monday. When you go out there, some of y'all get quiet on me there. Wear your, wear your Sunday clothes on Monday. Why? Because you see, in this place, all of we is king. We ain't sitting in your clothes. Y'all ain't hearing me. You hear me. <laughs> he wants you to go out there where they think you ain't nobody. And put on your best and step out there. Yes. And they're supposed to say, did you see what she had on today? Make their knees weak. And the Bible says, when he saw the food that was upon the plate. It says she was overwhelmed. And then when she was finished. She said, I'm ready to see him now. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. When she walked inside the room, big, beautiful palace. The Bible describes this place. And she walks inside. It says her heart fainted within her. I mean, let me tell you. I got a feeling that within the next five years, give five years, God going to bless you with a house that when they walk in, Come on, you all better receive this little blessing. Yes, They're going to say, Ah. Oh. <laughs> Lift your hands and thank God for that blessing. You think you got a good house now. God got another one. Because they ain't impressed with that yet. He says she became weak. And then Solomon says, Come, sit. And she began to ask him questions. And he answered her. And the wisdom that came out of this man's mouth, it says she was overwhelmed. And when he finished the conversation and everything, the Bible says, then he said, bring silver, gold, frankincense, myrrh, camels, donkeys, asses, everything. Bring all the stuff. And the Bible said, what happened? And the Bible, he said, bring the shields and the goblets and the plates. And the Bible says the donkeys were staggering with the weight coming in to see yes, a woman. Sir, yes, sir, yes, sir. And then King Solomon said, you could have this. 
Come on, y'all, praise him. <laughs> Woo! What a king! What is Solomon doing? Protecting his reputation. Now notice, this is important, it's very important. He didn't bring it out and just showed it to her and then took it back. That's enough to impress her. But he says, you could have it. I believe God's about to give you some things. No, let me, let me say it another way. I, I feel this coming here now. See, sometimes you go into God, pray, say, oh, Lord, you are beautiful. Praise the Lord. And you in his presence. And you say, oh, well, I'm by his presence. And then when church out, you go home and say, boy, that was a good service, eh? And you didn't bring nothing with you. In other words, the king don't want you to come in just to look at his wealth. That's the difference. When you leave, he wants you to carry stuff with you. For two reasons. One, protect his name. And two, so everyone who you meet on the way back to Africa will ask you. Now, you left here with one cup, but you're coming back with seven. You left here with one donkey. You got seven donkeys. Where you been? I got it. <laughs> Come on, scream at me. <laughs> Woo! Tell me where you been. Child, I been the one king. And that king, I thought I was king. But that king, Lord have mercy. My donkeys, I hardly stand up because I went to see the king. God going to bless you because he wants others to talk about him. Lift your hands. Just come on, praise him for a second. Come on, praise him. Thank him for that. He's going to bless you so others could talk about him. That's what kings are like. Finally, here's some scripture. I want to give you some scripture to write down, and then we're going to close. The reputation of a king is his integrity, his glory. First Samuel. Here's some scriptures to write down, please. Very important. Now, in each one of these scriptures, this word reputation shows up in the Hebrew language. I'm going to show you how it's written in the English. 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 22 says, For the sake of his great name, the Lord will not reject his people, because the Lord was pleased to make you his own. Now, this is a very important statement. God says, look, I'm going to bless you, not because I like you. This is deep. I ain't going to bless you because you're doing everything right. I'm not going to bless you because you're wearing long robes and speaking in tongues. Come on, you all talk to me. This is deep. He said, I'm going to bless you because of my name's sake, my reputation. I'm going to, he said, I know you're doing some things you ain't supposed to do. He said, but I already call you my own. Read it. He says, I call you my own. I say, you are my child. Now, some of you all got children. They don't always behave right, but you still feed them the same food when they come to the table, eh? They sleep in the bed, right? <laughs> and sometimes they make you so mad you feel like putting them out, but then you put them right back in the bed every night. Why? Because that's your name. You don't want, my mother to say, now y'all don't make my name shame in the neighborhood. <laughs> God is going to fix your situation. Not because you are righteous, but because his name is on you. For my namesake, your business is going to prosper. This last three months, you thought it was tough. You're about to hit a breakthrough. I prophesied to somebody. Your business has been at a standstill. And God said, now you heard this message. I'm about to make it come to pass. I'm going to do something you ain't never expected. And I'm going to bless you so much, they're going to say, only God could have done that. Lift your hands and thank him. It's going to happen to you. I say, it's going to happen to you. Look at this verse, 2 Samuel 7. Again, God speaks. It says, for the sake of your word and according to your will, you have done this great thing and made it known to your servants because of your will, your name. 2 Kings 19, I love this one. Verse 34, it says, I will defend this city and save it, not because I like the people. 
But because of what? My name's sake. And for the sake of my servant David. I believe the more we tell people God lives in the Bahamas, God has to defend the Bahamas. And the more public we make it, the more pressure we put on God. Because the Bible says, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. You ought to give, give him praise. He is Lord of the Bahamas. Say it loud. You are Lord of the Bahamas. When I stand up in the world and I tell people by television, wherever I am, millions of people tell them, God lives in the Bahamas. I got them all saying it now. Which means we are two agree. In the name of Jesus. He says, I will save the city because of my name's sake. And that's why we got to keep that wonderful preamble in our constitution. Because that puts God under pressure. You didn't hear what I said. When you constitutionally tell God that he is the Lord of the country, God's name is on the line. By the way, they caught Saddam. Did you all know that? Now they got to get him saved. Come on, clap loud. You got to get him saved. Don't kill him. You got to get him saved. Lord, let me go to the prison where they put him, please. For your name's sake. I want to go see him. Open that door for me, Lord Jesus. He's no different from Paul, the apostle. Paul was a killer. Killed so many people, we don't know how many he killed. And yet God made him a great apostle. Wouldn't it be wonderful the Apostle Saddam? Come on, y'all shout like y'all got faith in God, huh? Hallelujah! That's the prayer we should pray. God came to save what? Sinners. He's one and we're one. He saved us, he could save Saddam Hussein. Amen. Reverend Dam Hussein. Saddam Hussein. Oh, who that's it? Reverend Saddam Hussein. In the name of Jesus. Oh, stop it. You all ain't praying for me hard enough. That's the problem. Father, don't damn him. Save him. In the name of Jesus. Psalm 25, write this down, please. For the sake of your name, O Lord, forgive my iniquity, though it is great. Guess who's praying? David. Guess what he just did? Committed adultery. He said, look, don't forgive me because of my sin. Forgive me because of your reputation. What an incredible prayer. I said, what an incredible prayer. God says, forgive me because the people know me being in association with you. All these years I've been telling them you is my God. Now I messed up, so you better fix me up. Because they're going to say that you can't save. Forgive me for your own reputation's sake. Did he do that for you too? He sure did. He forgives us because of his name's sake. We give him thanks, huh? Last verses, Psalm 79, verse 9. Help us, O Lord, O God, our Savior, for the glory of your name. Deliver us and forgive us our sins for your name's sake. All these prayers are for the reputation of God. Verse 10. Why should the nation say, where is their God? I love that one. He said, look, you better save us so that people won't say, well, where is this God they've been claiming? God's reputation is going to bring you out of your dilemma. I'm going to say it again. God's reputation is going to bring you out in your dilemma. His reputation. His name. Boy, I tell you, I feel anointing here this morning. Whitney, you ready to sing? Jeremiah 14. Get your song together, please. Jeremiah 14, 21 says, For the sake of your name, do not despise us. Write that down, please. 
do not dishonor your glorious throne. Do not dishonor your throne by despising us. The word despise there doesn't mean to hate. Make sure you jot this down. It means to ignore. Ignore. Listen to that. Read it. Put, it. put ignore in there. It says, for the sake of your name, do not ignore us. In other words, if you don't do something about my situation, your reputation is about to fall, God. And then he says, he says, do not dishonor your glorious throne. I told the people that I sit with Christ in heavenly places. Don't let them dishonor your throne. The name of a king makes him act. The name of a king makes him save. The name of a king makes him deliver. Ezekiel 20, verse 44. You will know that I am the Lord. What is the Lord? Owner. When I deal with you for my name's sake and not according to your evil ways and your corrupt practices, O host of Israel, declares the sovereign Lord. Because look, I want to kill you because of what you're doing. He said, but I can't kill you because I told the people I am a good God. So because you act in rude, I'm still going to treat you good. I'm going to fix you up. Why? Not because of the way you behave. Let me tell you, this sets you free from the pressure of guilt. Some of you have done some dumb things. And you're still carrying stuff with you that God forgave 20 years ago. And God is saying, will you just stop this? My name is at stake. I'm going to bring you out, not because of you doing things right. I'm going to bring you out because you keep, you keep telling people you belong to me. <laughs> oh, I see why Jesus had to go get Peter. Peter was too prominent in his party. You know what I mean? Everybody knew Peter was with him. Everybody knew. So Christ said, go, go get Peter. Bring him. I got to make sure that everybody know that I am king and I'm a good king. My name must remain intact. And he made Peter his leader. He will save you and forgive you for his reputation. Not because you've done anything right. Ladies and gentlemen, it doesn't mean we do wrong. It means that we need to keep, to, to keep aware that the name of the king is his whole life. Thank you once again for listening to this message as we hope that it has been a blessing to you. Our goal is to show you new paths and opportunities so that you can discover your purpose. It is your love, support, and partnership that makes Monroe Global possible. Please visit us online at www.monroeglobal.com for more product, partnership, or to join us at one of our live events around the world.